Begin today the Gemara on Daf Kuf Yudalit on the base, four lines up from the top of the page. The Gemara continues the halachis of a mashkin when a person is uh, trying to collect a loan and uh, he doesn't get the money, so he's going to take a collateral. Omar Rabbi Yechenen said, Mishkenoi, if a person takes a mashkin from the borrower and then umes, the uh, borrower dies. Now, he, what's the halacha with the mashkin? As we learned before, every mashkin you have to return it to the borrower in the time when he needs to use it. If it's a begged lila, you have to turn it to him at night, or if it's something he needs by day, return it to him by day. So the case that Gemara is talking about over here is, you took this mashkin, but then you return it to the borrower for using it, and when it was in the possession of the borrower, he dies. So now who has it? It's in the possession of the children. Shoim toim al gabi bonav. He can go and grab it from the children, and the reason is, because once he took this as a mashkin, the, the lender has a kenyan over this mashkin. Learned that from the Chot Yitzdoke, that it, he has a kenyan over it. Usually, by any loan, you say that the fact that a lender can collect the loan from the borrower after he dies, you can collect from his estate, from properties, from karka, but you can't, the metal and you can't take uh, any movable items, you can't take from children. But in this case, this mashkin, because it's something which you already have a kenyan over it, it's yours, even if you give it back to the children and they have it, and they gave it back to the borrower and not in the children's possession, you're able to collect it. So the man asks on this, Meisve in a Braise, it says, Omer Rab Meir. Rab Meir said about a mashkin, If you're taking a collateral from the borrower, why are you returning it to him? You return it every night or every day. Why are you returning it to him? So the Gemara right away asks, what's Rab Meir saying here? The question is, why do you have to return it? It says in the Tata that uh, you have to return it, as the Psukim we brought, that by Hashem is Shiva and so on, you have to return it, that's why you return it. Elo, so the way to read the Braise is, if you have to return it to him, so what's the point of taking it back the next night? You're going to have to give it back to him again. So what's the point of this? So the Braise here answers, or Meir answers, the reason is, You're taking it back from him so that you, the lender, should have it in, in his possession so that when Shemitah comes, it should be in the, in the lender's possession. Because when you have a mashkin, the, the Shemitah, Shemitah's Ksafim we're talking about, when Shemitah comes and it absolves all loans, if you have a mashkin though in your possession, it doesn't absolve that long because you already like collected it already, you have it already. And also, the point of taking it back again the next day is, so that if the borrower dies, if the mashkin is going to be in his possession, and he dies, so then you can't take it from the children. But if you have it in your possession, in the lender's possession, so then you have it. So here, you see, the clearly not like what Rabbi Yechina says. Says the Gemara, the only reason why you can keep this mashkin after the borrower dies is because you took it back. When he died, you had it in your possession. Oh, but if you didn't take it back again, if you returned it to him and you would keep it there, then when the borrower dies, you wouldn't be able to take it from the children. So it's a question of Yechen. Rabbi Yechen says, once you took the mashkin from him, you have a Kenyan on it. Even after you return it to the children, but no, you can go and collect it from the children. It's yours. You have it's, it's, it belongs to you. It's, you have a Kenyan. Oh, Maravad Bamasna answers this. Didn't you have to change the, and answer and change the version of the words of this Braise? As the Gemara began, the way the Braise read literally didn't make any sense. So we had to change the version of what the Braise says. If that's the case, so So then you'll have to change the version further and answer the words of the Braise and say as follows. And the question that Amir was really asking is that since you return the mashkin to the, the borrower every night, or whenever he has to use it. So, the question he asked was, what's the point to take the mashkin altogether? When, whenever the, the borrower doesn't feel any pressure here, when, whenever he needs it, whenever he needs his pillow, you, you arrive to his house and you return it to him. So, what's the point of taking the mashkin altogether? So on that, the main answer, that once you take that mashkin initially, so now that you have ownership over that mashkin, and now, even after you return it to him, the Shemitah will not uh, absolve this long. That's why you're taking it. And also, and that once you have a Kenyan over it, so now it's not going to be like any other movable items by the child after the father passes away that you can't collect. No, once you have a Kenyan, even if you're returning it to him, you'll be able to collect it from the child. That's, that, that's what Rav Meir was explaining.
Yeah, okay. So now, I mean, Tesis of here actually asks, if that's the case, then you should take the mashkin once and then give it back and you accomplish what you had to accomplish. What's the mm-hmm. point of keeping on taking it back again? So, so Tesis over here says that the reason you do that is because you're afraid one day this borrower, as you see, is refusing to pay, may one day come and deny the entire loan. So you want to constantly have something as a security. Every collateral is a security to remind him also for the, for the fact that uh, you have this loan. And also, Tesis says that this will also motivate him to pay, even though he has his mashke whenever he needs it. He has his pillow whenever he needs it, so why does he care? No, Tesis says he does care, because every day you're coming to his house, taking the mashkin, it's embarrassing for him. People see... Who's forcing him to give the mashkin every day? Who's forcing him? To give the mashkin no, he has to. He has to, yeah, with the shleich of a bezdin, yeah, he, he has to... Uh, you're not allowed to go into his house, so I mean, uh, yeah, it could be. You have to come every day with a shleich of a bezdin, but he has to give the mashkin, yeah. Sure, he has to give the mashkin. The bezdin's going to force him to do that, but it becomes embarrassing for him, and that embarrassment will also motivate him to pay. You're not allowed to come into the borrower's house to take this collateral. You're not allowed to enter into the house of a borrower. But if there's a guarantor on this loan, over here, the lav does not apply. In the house of the guarantor, if the, if the borrower is not paying, so then you are allowed to go into his house to take a mashkin. We learned this from a Pasek. Lokach big doi. Ki orev zar. You take his garment because he became a orev. He's a guarantor for a, for a stranger. A person becomes a guarantor for his neighbor. You can come and take his garment. The gaimer. Uh, the Mufarshim here I actually ask. It's not clear how the Gemara is proving from the lotion of this Pasik that you can go into his house. It says you can take his garment as a collateral if he's not paying you when he's a guarantor. But it's not where you see that you can go into his house. Some say anachanami. It's not trying to prove this point about going into his house, but it's just trying to prove the fact that when an orev is, is he, he obligated himself to pay, pay as a guarantor, and if he's not going to pay, then you can even take a mashkin from him. The oimer is another pasuk there. It says all mishle. It says bini my son. If you are a guarantor for your friend, you stretched out your palm for your friend. It's one, one thing that, uh, that the Pasuk talks about, or another thing. You uh, stumbled with the words of your mouth. You got caught with the words of your mouth. So what should you do? So the Pasuk continues, This is what you should do, my son. You'll be saved. If you came into the palm of your friend's uh, hands, Leich hisrapes, go in hisrapes. Hisrapes literally means you should humble yourself for him. Verav reyacha, and you should uh, be with. I forgot how it had the simple touch of rahav. Rav reyacha, you should be with your friend. Some uh, rahav. And Gemara here touches what what this pasuk is saying here. It's talking about two different things between you and your friend. One is im momin yesh loy biyotcha. If there's money that your friend has in your hands. And that is because you're a guarantor, as it started off. The Pasuk said, There's money now that you obligated yourself because of being a guarantor. Then what should you do? The, the word hisrapes refers to that. When it says hisrapes, it doesn't just mean be humble. It means something else. Hatterloi pieces yad. Open up the palm of your hands, which means pay. pay. Open up your hands and pay money that you obligated yourself to pay. Ve'in love. If it's not a money matter between you and your friend, Rather, it's words that you offended your friend. That's what it means when the Pasuk says you got caught with your words or you, you, you stumbled with your words, meaning that you offended your friend. So then you're going to pay him with money. That's not the right thing. Don't, don't, pay, don't pay him with money to appease him. Rather, what do you do? Harbal of Reim, you should bring many friends to talk to him, to appease him for, for this that you, uh, that you heard him with words. Now the Gemara, this continuation of the Braise, it goes back to the Pasuk that we said before, that this Isr of entering into the borrower's house to take a uh, collateral only applies to a borrower. So as we said, it doesn't apply to an a- Orev. Now the Gemara says another Pshat, Litzat Sheini, another, another thing you can learn out from the Pasuk here, Lebeisa Yat Tenichnas, you're not allowed to go into the house of the borrower. Avalat Tenichnas, Lishar Katov, if there is a porter that was hired, and he's not getting paid, it's going back to what we discussed before, a person that has to be paid on time. So a porter that's not being paid, or a, a donkey driver that's not being paid, or a person that rent, rents from you and he's not paying you the rent, or a person that uh, drawing, is doing a, a job, drawing for his friend, and he's not getting paid. In those cases, you are allowed to go into the person's house, your employee, employer, to go and take a, a mashkin for this. 
So on this, the price says, Yachayel, I feel it's like all of All these people that owe, are owed money for the job, for the work that they did, I would think that even in a case where it was established as a loan, where, where the, 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 the employer says, listen, I can't pay you today, but I'll give you a date. Until this and this date, this amount of money that I owe you, I owe you and I'll pay you by that date. So then you basically took this that you, money that you owe him and you turned it into a loan. And by you set it a certain date that you're going to pay him by. So now you would think that then, because originally it was a, a pay for the work you did, you could go into his house. But Laima, the Pasuk, when it says you can't go into the person's house, it says, Mashas Mo'uma. Any type of uh, the money that you're demanding of him as a loan, whether the loan was a Chathila loan or now it became a loan, either way you can't go into his house. When it comes to a widow, whether she's poor, whether she's rich, you're not allowed to take any mashkin at all from her. The Pasuk says, you're not allowed to take the garment of a widow as a mashkin. The Shayim discussed this over here, this, this halacha of not taking a mashkin from an almana. First of all, they discussed when get to whether this applies also when the loan begins. If you're lending money to an almana, can you then say, I'm only lending the money to you if you give me a mashkin? Or maybe no, it's only talking about taking an almana later when she doesn't have the money to pay. Another thing that Yishayim discusses here, or the Paiskim discusses, is what is included in almana? Does almana mean literally an almana? Or any woman that's like an almana, a, a, a grusha, a divorced woman, any woman that's living herself single, the same Allah applies. It's also a discussion. Tana Rabbanon says the Gemara, the Braise says, Almana, Ben Shiania, Ben Shiashira, and Almana, whether she's poor or rich, ain't Mamashkin and Isa. You can't take a mashkin from her. Divri Rabbi Yehuda, it's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. Like it said in our Mishnah. Rabshemin Noimer, however, Rabshemin says, Ashira, Mamashkin and Isa. And an Almana that's rich, you could take a mashkin from her. Ania, ain't Mamashkin and Isa. But if she's poor, then you can't take the mashkin from her. Why not? Because if she's poor, you're going to have to return the mashkin for her. She needs it. It's only, her only pillow that she has. You're going to have to come and return it to her. And then there's going to be a bad rumor amongst the friends. Every night, this person comes by. This man comes by to the house. It doesn't look good. So by an ashira, the person doesn't have to come every day to return the pillow. She doesn't need a pillow. So he's not coming. But by an ania... We, but if she again, you're not allowed in the house anyway. No, he's not. He's not going. Well, when he's returning, it, he can go into the house. Oh. Talking about taking the mashkin, huh? No, the person, the borrower himself, comes and returns it. When you take the mashkin, you need the shliach bezin. But the person himself is coming to return it, and he comes every night. So by an aniyah, that's a problem. But by a rich almana, where you don't have to return it, let's say there's a rich almana, and she has a certain loan she took. She's making an investment, and she doesn't. She doesn't want to return the loan right now. So, but you, you took a mashkin from her, but she's okay if you keep that mashkin. You don't have to come every night with her to, 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 to her with the mashkin. So over there, it's not a problem. Mm. So Rav Shimon argues with the Mishnah. Says the Gemara, Lememre, the Rabbi Yehuda, loy darish time of the Kra. Should we say, like we see here in this Braise, Rabbi Yehuda is saying, it says in the Torah, don't take an, a, a, a mashkin from an almana. We're not going to look at the reason for it. We just say almana means almana, no matter what. We don't, it's uh, rich or poor. And Rav Shimon, Darish time of the Kra, and Rav Shimon is the one that's giving a reason what the problem is of taking the mashkin from an almana. And therefore he says, there's a distinction between if she's rich or poor. We see in a different place the opposite, that it's Rav Yehuda the one that follows the reasoning of the Pasik, and Rav Shimon does not. Tanya, as we learned in the Brais or the Tnan, we learned in the Mishnah, Velo Yabalei Noshim, a king is not allowed to have too many wives. As the Gemara there says, you're not allowed to have more than 18 wives. <laughs> That's the, 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 the love that it says by a king. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, Marbuhu, he actually could have more than 18 wives, but as long as it's such wives that are righteous and they're not causing him, that his heart should turn away from Hashem. The Pasuk there says that if you have too many wives, they'll cause you to turn away from Hashem. So if that's the case, follow the reason. That if it, it doesn't cause him to turn away, he could have even more. So we see Rabbi Yehuda follows the reason. Rabbi Shimon says, If, if, if even one wife causes him to turn away from Hashem, so he shouldn't marry her either. When the Torah says that he should not have too many wives, he shouldn't have more than 18 wives, what is it saying? Even if he has wives that are like the wife of Shlema, of David HaMelech, Avigail, which was a very big tzaddikas, if 18 wives, not more. That's the maximum. Even if the reason doesn't apply, but it doesn't matter. You have to follow exactly what the Torah says, 18 and not more. 
So here you see that Shimon says that loyar beloy is even if the reason of loyasul of liboy doesn't apply, even if the, all of his wives he's marrying uh, all of them that is a, a righteous as Avigail. And says the Gemara, no, actually we see over here like like the point that we saw in the to the din of the mashkin by Dalmana that really lo oilam Rabbi Yehuda loy darish time of the kra. Rabbi Yehuda is the one that doesn't follow the reasoning of the Pasik, like we saw by the Almana, that whether she's rich or poor, you're not allowed to take a mashkin. So why over here does Rabbi Yehuda say that you can marry more than 18 wives as long as the reason doesn't apply? So in other words, it's all based on the reason. Because Here the Pasik itself gives you the reason. When the Pasik says, like by the, by the mashkin, it doesn't give a reason. It just says, don't take a mashkin from an almana. Right? So you don't take a mashkin from any almana. But if the Pasik itself is giving the reason, so over here, you have to, it's, that's clear in the Pasik. <coughs> so you follow the reason. My time, the only reason you shouldn't have more wives is in order not to go away from Hashem. Rav Shimon, but now Rav Shimon and the opposite. Rav Shimon is actually the one that holds that you always follow the reason of the Pasuk, whether it says it explicitly, and even if not, I'll explain the reason of the Pasuk. That's Rav Shimon always darshans the time of the Pasuk. So if so, Rav Shimon says here as follows, Mechti letzi, ba'alme darshin time of the Kra. We always darshan the reason for what the Pasuk says, even when it doesn't give the reason, like Rav Shimon does by Almana. He says that it only applies by an Aniyah, by a poor Almana, not by a rich Almana. If so, the question becomes here, Let the Torah write, don't marry many women. It's not necessary for the Torah to give the reason for it. I'll darshan and understand the reason of my own. We always darshan the reason of the Pasik. The reason you shouldn't have too many wives is because the person is going to go away from Hashem. So now, lo yosor, the cause of Rahman alamali. Why is the Torah writing additionally the reason here? So here, this is extra. Comes out dafka according to Shimon, which understands the reason without what the pasuk says. So now, lo yosor is extra. What is it coming to say? Afila achas umesiras libai. That even if there's just one wife and she is not righteous and she calls him to go away from the Abish there, reza lo yisad. No, I shouldn't bar. I shouldn't marry her. So that's why Rabbi Shimon added out. Rabbi Shimon says that even one wife that's meser libai, you shouldn't marry her. So this is it's always brought in shas. Rabbi Shimon is the one. Shimon ben Yichai. Rabbi Shimon is the one that uh, the darshan's time of the kra. A person that takes as the collateral the person's mill, millstones. As, so the, the millstones are, are made up of two stones. There's the bottom stone and the top stone. The top stone is called the rechev because it, it sort of rides on top. And the bottom stone is what's called rechayim. So you chayiv, when you take someone's millstone, you even a loisessa for taking this, these millstones. The chayiv mishom shnei kelim. And you also chayiv twice. Because there's two parts of the millstone, the top stone and the bottom. Shenema lo yachbol rechayim verechev. Don't take not the rechayim, the top, the bottom that is, and verechev, the one that's on the top. Veloy verechayim verechev bovad domru. It's not only the millstones. If you take as a mashkin that you're going to be over the lav. Ela kol dover sheoisim by oichel nefesh. Anything that you take from the borrower that he needs in order to to produce food for himself, you're not allowed to take. Shenema, as the pasuk says, ki nefesh uchayvul. That you're uh, taking his, his life away from him, you're harming and taking away his life from him, you're going to be over the Slav. Yeah, there's a big discussion here in Tesis regarding this that it says you get Malchus here because seemingly it looks like a Lav and Nitik say, because if you take this Mashkin, so then you can just give it back. You give it back. So, so it's a Lav and Nitik say. But Tesis says, no, you see here from this mission that it's not a Lav and Nitik say. Yeah, if you take it, you have to give it back. But it doesn't say in the Pusik anywhere that this is a lav and itik lase, like it says, Veshav is exayla shagazal. You weren't allowed to take it. So, so you, you have to give it back. That's what you see here from this Mishnah. Omar Avone, Saravone says, Chaval Rechayim, if you take a mashkin just a Rechayim, one of the stones of the millstones, like the Stein, just for that itself, you get Malchus twice. Why? Mishom Rechayim, the fact that you took the Rechayim, as the Pusik says, don't take that stone. And also, when the Pasuk in the end says, Nefesh Hu Chayvul, that's an additional Malchus that you get for, for taking this. So, so there's two Malchus here just on this itself. One second, one second. Rechayim Verechev, if a person takes the Rechayim and the Rechev, both stones, the top stone and the bottom stone, then like a Shalish, you're going to get Malchus three times. Mishom Rechayim Verechev. For taking both of the stones of the millstone, and also mishom ki nefesh uchayvul. When it says in the pasuk in the beginning lo yachpoil, the lo yachpoil also goes on nefesh uchayvul. What did the Mishnah say? The Mishnah said nefesh uchayvul is a lav that you're not allowed to take anything which is oichel nefesh. It's a general lav. 
It includes everything. So according to Rav Hune, that general lav goes on any other kind of object that you take that's, that he needs for, for his livelihood. But also it applies back to the detail that the Pasuk says here. That if you take the Rechev, you get Malkus for the Rechev and for the Nefesh Uchevel. And the same thing Rechayim. And if you take all, both of them, you're going to get three times Malkus. The Gemara soon is going to refer to this as, as a lav Shebuchlolos. When you have a lav that is, includes... It's a general love. Nefesh Uchevel, you get Malkus even on a love Shabbachlalus. Rav Yudai Mer, however, Rav Yudai disagrees and says, Chevel, sorry, Choval Rechayim Leikachas. If you just took the bottom stone of the millstones, you get once Malkus, like it says in the Pasuk, Leyach Bo Rechayim. Rechev Leikachas. If you take the, the Rechev, the top stone, you, you get also once Malkus. Rechayim Rechev, if you take both of these stones, Leikishtayim, you get Malkus twice. Now, the other part of the Pasuk where it says the lav regarding Bechlau, that you shouldn't take anything that's his livelihood, that goes on any other things. It's not coming to add another lav for the Rechaim and the Rechev itself. That, that, that's the beginning of the Pasuk. The, the next part of the Pasuk is coming to teach me regarding other things. So you're not going to get three times Malchus if you take both millstones. Shall we say that there was a machloikis between Abaya and Rav regarding how you're supposed to roast the carbon Pesach? So over there, <laughs> that machloikis of Abaya and Rav, they're arguing in the same machloikis of Huna and of Yehuda right over here. Why? Because the Omar Rav. Rav says, If a person eats the carbon Pesach, not fully roasted. So you get Malchus twice. Why twice? What does it say there in the Pasuk? It says, Don't eat it partially roasted or partially cooked. Don't eat it cooked in water. And then it says, It has to be fully roasted. Right? So the end of the Pasuk, is part of the law, that don't eat it unless it's roasted. So therefore, Rav says, if you eat it partially roasted, so you have it twice. One is, Mishum no. It says in the Pasuk, don't eat it partially roasted. And also, o mishom ki, ki tzliyesh, that you should only eat it if it's fully roasted. So that's uh, the end of the Pasuk, is saying an additional, uh, additional lava there. Roasted, roasted yeah, roasted on the fire. Mavoshul, same thing also, Rav says, if you eat it cooked in water, like each time, you also get Malchus twice. Mishom mavoshul, the fact that you cooked it and didn't roast it. And o mishom ki im tzliyesh, the end of the Pasuk is adding and saying, only if it's roasted, you should eat it. No, umavoshul. If you eat the carbon pesach and part of it was no, which is either partially roasted or partially cooked, and then another part of the carbon pesach was totally cooked, so then like a shalish, you're gonna get malchus for all three for eating it no, for eating it mavoshul, and also for what it says in the end of the pasuk kiyim tzliyesh. Mishum as oh, it's well as that mishum no, mishum mavoshul, mishum lesachlanu kiyim tzliyesh. Abaya Omar, however, Abaya disagrees. Ain't like an alav shabachlalus. You don't get Malchus on what it says in the end of the Pasuk, Ki Im Sli Eish, which is saying the general the thing that the Tater wants, that you should only roast it and not cook it. It's, so that, that lav, which is saying the general thing here, there's no separate lav for that. The details that the Tater spells out, no, and Bavosho, that's what you get Malchus for. So says the Gemara, Leime, Abaye, Domekar of Yehuda. Abaye over here follows what Rav Yehuda said. That uh, over here as well, when it comes to the Chaim and Rechev, you only get Malchus for the two, the two uh, things that it said specifically in the Pasik, which is the two millstones. The general thing that it says in the end of the Pasik, that the uh, Nefesh Uchayvul, that you don't get Malchus for. Just like here, you don't get Malchus for the general thing the Pasik says, Kiyam Sliyesh. And the Rave, the Amak Ravhuna, and Rave follows the reasoning of Ravhuna that says, you get Malchus for what the Torah specifies, and then you also get Malchus for the general law that the Torah says afterwards. That says the Gemara, no. Both of them could follow, both Abaya and Rava can fit with both Ravuna and Rav Yudah. Rava, Amalach, Rava will tell you, or rather, Amalach, Rava, that is, uh, sorry, let me just get the, uh, yeah, Amalach, Rava, Rava will tell you, I'm not the Omri, I feel like Rav Yudah. My opinion can go even with what Rav Yudah says. Why? Because at kind of like when Rav Yehuda says regarding the pasuk where it says that you shouldn't nefesh nefesh that you shouldn't take the, that is not a separate love to be over on. Why? Over there, nefesh uchayvul does not mean rechaim rechev. It goes on other things. It's a separate thing. It's coming to add other th- other things that a person has a livelihood, a livelihood from not. The millstones. So Hilkoch Lishar Tvarim Hudasa. It's an extra lav in the Pasik and it, it, does, it doesn't go on the millstones. 
That's why over there, if you took the two millstones, you're only going to be over twice for those millstones, not for the for the nefesh. It's a, it's a separate thing. Avol hacha, but over here, when the Torah says kiim sliyesh, you should roast it in fire. Lamayasa. What is it saying? Once the pasuk says that it shouldn't be partially roasted, it shouldn't be cooked in water. So then, so you know, you have to roast it in fire. Why is the Torah adding to that it should be roasted in fire? Shmami no lalav. There isn't anything else outside of this that it's coming to add. It's, it's going on this itself that you have to roast it in fire. So therefore, it's only writing it to give you another, another Malchus, another lab. That's why Rava holds that over here, you could get three times Malchus. On the other hand, Vabaya Omalach. Abaya will tell you, Anod Omri, I can tell you, Afil Ravuna. Even according to Ravuna. The reason why Rav Huna says by the Pasuk when it says that that is a separate time that you're going to be over even when you're just taking the millstones. The reason is Hasam over there because Nefesh Uchayvul is extra and given the Yisaydahu once it's extra I actually do throw it back and say that this lav of Nefesh Uchayvul does apply back to the millstones that you take. So Rashi explains what Rav is saying over here is what Avhuna was saying by the Nefesh Shukhaival and Khanami, Nefesh Shukhaival is extra, and therefore I learn it out, I learn out from it that it goes on other things, not just the millstones, it goes on other things that a person needs for his livelihood. But once I see that the Torah says that, that there's a lab for anything that you take from this person for this livelihood, that also includes a person's millstones. Yeah, it's a lav shebuchlalis, it's a general lav that includes everything, but you could also say that that goes back on, on the millstones, which is also a livelihood. So therefore I do put it back on the Rechaim Verechev. So if he takes these two millstones, he's going to be over on those two laven that it specifies, and also on the Nefesh Uchayvo. Let's just finish the Indian here. Avol hacha, but over here, kiim sliyesh. When the Torah adds and says, only if it's roasted in the fire, lav yiseiduhu. Those words are not extra at all. Those words are actually written to teach me something very specific. The mibay lekidatanya, because that's learned that, that that's here to teach, teach us what it says in uh, in Abraisa. And what is this? That b'sha sheyeshnoi bekom echayel tsli in the time when you have the mitzvah sasei to eat the carbon pesach roasted yeshnoi bebal teichal no. That's when you have the lav not to eat from it if it's partially roasted. B'sha sheeni bekom echayel tsli eni bebal teichal no. If it's a time, if the person is, it takes the carbon pesach and he doesn't eat it roasted, but it's not, it's not, it's not the night of pesach. It's another time. He leaves it for another time. Not in that time when he's supposed to eat it. So then you're not going to be over on this lav. So this this uh, ki esh is coming to tell you the timing of when you're over the lav. So it can't be used to say that you get another time malchus. It's not extra. The Torah is writing it to tell you this specific halacha of the timing of it. Therefore, over here you can say that you're not over another lav, like uh, Abai's opinion. <laughs>